welcome to the Intuitive Insights podcast series. I'm Nina Lockwood, founder and director of Intuitive Interim and Executive Search. Throughout this series, I will be sharing engaging conversations with talented leaders from across the UK transport sector. Welcome to this special edition of Intuitive Insights podcast, recorded especially for International Women's Day 2021. I'm absolutely beyond delighted to welcome Emma Diamond, Chief Exec of Motion Rail, to join me on the virtual couch to share her inspirational career story, her thoughts on what really matters in terms of the success of a business, and her advice to her 13-year-old self. I really hope you enjoy it and that you're as inspired as I am. Emma, good morning and welcome to the Intuitive Insights Special Edition podcast for International Women's Day 2021. Good morning, Nina. I'm absolutely thrilled that you have um, you've you've chosen to join me on this podcast because when we spoke a few months ago, I was so absolutely and totally inspired by your story that when it came to thinking Mm -hmm. about International Women's Day and what message do we want to get out there with the hashtag choose to challenge, um, you're just the most obvious person that came into my head. So I'm looking forward to asking you to share that story. Before I do that, I'm going to make you blush a bit because I know that you're kind of, um, you know, a bit kind of, Ooh, let's not talk about the awards. And we need to talk about the awards because Motion Rail and you as <laughs> the leader of the business are, are making a lot of noise in the rail industry and people love you. Everyone's talking about you. So we've got recently the Rail Business Award for Education and Training, which has been for the programme you've done um, on safety, children in schools you've won a principal contractor license for network rail so for an SME to win a tier one supplier status for network rail is a massive achievement you're the seventh fastest growing company in Wales you won the rail industry association SME growth award um, in combined in joint joint winners with three squared and um, and this comes as no surprise to me, but Emma, it's the Women in Rail Inspirational Woman of the Year for 2020. There's loads more, but you've, I've promised I won't go on with a long list, but there are more. <laughs> Emma, it's amazing. Um, and I just wanted you to have the opportunity to share some of this story because I know that other people out there are going to be as inspired as I am. So I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to hand over to you. Um, because I would love you to tell our audience your career story. Take us right back to the beginning and tell us how you got to be in the role that you're currently in now. Okay. Um, right. Well, where do I start? First of all, um, you know, I, I didn't win all those things. My amazing team did. Um, and I'm exceptionally proud of them. And you're right. Uh, our, our SME status becoming a tier one we were immensely proud and I'm immensely proud of the team for the hard work that they put in. Um, but yeah, it's a real privilege to be asked um, my story. Um, I, I very often sit and say it's my amazing team um, and, and and forget how hard I suppose sometimes I had to work to get where I am today and, and to be able to provide you know the working environment that, that we all have. Um, so where do I start at the beginning? Um, choosing to t- challenge, that's me. That's how I was brought up. That's just ingrained like a stick of rock. Don't accept what you're given. Go out and make your future whatever you want it to be. There were times when I didn't quite know what that was going to be. <laughs> I fell into rail, that's uh, no secret. But starting at the beginning, I suppose, as uh, a-, a young girl, I waitressed in a pub. I worked in in bars, I did all sorts of different things. I didn't do very well in school, I didn't take the academic route. I I think I struggled to conform is probably the word. Um, It was a challenge. I didn't want to do what I was told. Um, My mum would have called it naughty. (laughs) 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 I was challenging, even from a young age. Uh, I think that's, that's fair. You know, I can say that much. But, but most importantly, I wouldn't be told what to do. Um, I wanted to be different. I wanted to stand out. And 
you know what really strikes me looking back is that wasn't always for the right reasons I think when you're young you've got a lot of energy and, and I'm a very passionate person um, and I didn't always use that in a very constructive way um, in my youth so I didn't finish school um, I didn't go to college I didn't do all of the things that everybody hoped I would do um, but what I did do was experience life um, I made a lot of mistakes I did a lot of good things um, but I learned what made me happy very very quickly and and it was being passionate about something but I just didn't really know what that that direction was that I wanted to go in so I think I came across as being quite wayward as a child um, my mum had her hands full keeping me in a straight line um, and my granddad was hugely influential in my upbringing so I think that's where my story probably begins slightly wayward teenager working in a pub uh, watching engineers that were staying in the pub what I now know compile test results for cables that they were installing for global crossing at the time so they stayed with us for a matter of months and they used to come in and tell me what they were doing. And I thought, I could do that. That looks a bit cool. You know, I did like physics at school and science. So fiber optics and lasers and, you know, that welding things, the width of human hairs. I thought, oh, that's a bit different. I know I didn't want to be a hairdresser. I didn't want to go down the traditional route. I come from a family that were different. My mum had driven buses she had welded sections of the channel tunnel my aunt was a, a biochemist for bp um, she was flown out to oil rigs in the north sea and helicopters you know it was it was cool as a kid my granddad would tell me stories um and, and my grandma was one of the first royal naval wrens um and my gramps was a commander in the navy and i think for me that was quite different you know we, we all did very different things uh, I lived in a rural um, environment there wasn't really this you're a girl you're a boy you put your wellies on you went out and you helped down the farm you did what you had to do so when we talk about role models I think that played a really important part in my story and, and how things ended up it's really important to remember that from the outset there weren't gender definitions you know it wasn't that's a girl's job that's a boy's job it was you can be anything that you want to be you choose what what that is and the path you take you know the actions and consequences of that will, will form form your future so um, I was never told you can't or you shouldn't or you won't frankly if I had it I would have rebelled anyway because that was just who I was so choose the challenge we'll stick yeah. to that theme um so these these guys were cable jointing and, and and I went out and I had a look and I watched what they were doing and I thought I could do this and I went home and I told my mum who I think at the time probably thought I was a bit crazy but they were used to Emma having crazy ideas about everything um, and I approached my grandparents um, who were really supportive and said well why don't you go and look at some training courses you don't want to work in a pub forever and I thought yeah you're right so I did um, I went along and spoke to the Prince's Trust because there were a couple of schemes that they were running um, for young people like me. I had a little boy, so, you know, there was a lot of help available, actually. You know, people have often criticised, but I, I had support, lots of it. Um, I went to them with an idea and said, I'd like to do this first city and guilds. Would you help me? And they said, yes, we will. So the Prince's Trust came along, helped me make a business case. Wow, haven't I done lots of those since? But that was the first ever one um, to get me some hand tools for, for fiber optic jointing. Uh, they helped me with that one. And my grandparents came along and said, we'll match what you raise for the first one. So I put some savings in and they gave me some money too. And I went off to college. Uh, the first one was in London. And I did a couple of weeks and did a City and Guilds course in fiber optic cable jointing. Right. And that was really the first taste of freedom I'd ever had. So I was away from my little boy, which was a bit strange, but I was Emma back in a learning environment, something that, you know, I didn't finish in school. So this was quite a big deal. And I think I realized the opportunities I'd missed. I remembered those teachers telling me that, you know, you're dropping out of school. This is going to be a disaster. I think one in particular said, you'll never achieve anything in your life. And I think that was a key part, that the fact that I'm nearly 40 and still remember their words. Um, it made me angry because really my childhood was circumstance, a lot of it. <laughs> no, and, and it wasn't fair to be written off and I didn't like how that felt. So in college, I realised that I could do something. 
this was something that that maybe could lead to a career. I didn't know what that career would look like, but I was fascinated. So I went home full of all of the exciting stuff of, wow, I've learned this. And I showed my little boy what we've been doing. And you know, he was excited for me. And that was nice. And then my grandparents stepped in and said, here's some, some money. Um, and you know what? There's no point waiting till we're not here. We'd actually like to see you flourish and be alive to watch that. And I will be forever grateful for that influence because, you know, it, it really helped. Um, and I went away. I planned with uh, optical technology training um, up in Skipton in Yorkshire, a company still around that, that I use now to send my staff to, Richard Edney's team. Uh, and he said, I'll make you the most skilled cable engineer that this country's ever seen, I think, or something similar, and smiled and laughed because I kept coming back. <laughs> And it was like a sponge. I just wanted to soak it all up then. Um, my granddad lived in Yorkshire. He'd come and visit me and I was training and eventually got all of these qualifications, came home and thought, oh God, now what? <laughs> I don't actually have a job. I've never actually worked a day on site. What am I going to do? And so I applied for a load of jobs. Um, I got a job doing some data cabling on the Princess Margaret Hospital in Swindon. I think I fibbed about having experience in my CV. I'm not going to lie. Uh, I don't condone it, but sometimes needs must. Um, so I had a bit of experience. I got to site. I broke my arm the day before I was due to start on site. I oh, had it passed on. Um, yeah, it was an experience. I think I hid under my table um, because I had to supervise all of these engineers that clearly knew what they were doing and I didn't. And I didn't know how to read a drawing. And I rang the team at optical technology training with the hell and they did <laughs> they taught me very quickly over the phone what this drawing meant and I, I trusted the amazing engineers on site to go away and deliver it and just come back to me with problems where I think my skills as a mum kicked in then problems write a list be organized you can fix problems even if you don't really understand them we'll work on it so yeah that's how that job went and then uh, I spent a while we eventually got the hospital finished it's still there and standing today and then I went off to um, to, to home and, and applied for more jobs and Talis was one of them so that was my introduction to the railway I lived in Devon mm. my job was in Wales um, I was successful and I relocated myself and my son to Wales um, and that was 2001 so I think I joined in 2002 the railway finally yeah and um, at the age of 20, I uh, went and became a maintenance cable jointer that was highly skilled, expecting, you know, really high sort of uh, tech environments. I was given a shovel on my first day. <laughs> a high tech shovel. A very high tech shovel. You know, with a plastic handle and uh, a pair of boots and a busy vest and told, you're going to be a cable jointer. And so I had to go and get my PCS. Um, I met a great team of people. I had skills, but they weren't transferable to really to the railway at that point, you know. So um, actually, we just dug holes. And that was character building. Mm. We dug holes to learn how to dig out cables that might be damaged for approximately six weeks one summer. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it was definitely character building. A lot of character building going on in that six weeks, I would imagine. Yeah, I know the difference between uh, a flat and a ball nose shovel, and I know how to use a pick and a bar, <laughs> and I understand what a cat skin does. Yeah, definitely. I think I was a bit disappointed, if I'm honest, because I imagined the railway to be this high-tech, safety-critical environment, and actually it was full of dinosaurs, archaic equipment, no women at all. I didn't know anyone. I was by myself, and it was pretty terrifying. Um, so... I relied on the team of people, you know, to make friends and get on. And I learned very quickly that what didn't matter was that I was a girl. And I really was a young girl at that point. It yeah. didn't make any difference. They didn't care what, what my gender was. They cared. Was I prepared to dig and be just as exhausted as they were at the end of the day? Because we were in this together. We were a team. Um, and we dug holes and we made tea and we told stories and we laughed and joked and probably smoked as well, which I don't anymore. <laughs> but uh, you know, the good old days. I, I had a great time and I learned how to be part of a team. We had call outs in the middle of the night. We fixed cables. I learned how to manage the railway. I, I understood. I, I had friends. I had a, a new environment in Wales. Life was exciting and good. Um, 
and and I guess I got good at my job I worked twice as hard because I felt like I had something to prove probably to that teacher probably to my parents my granddad certainly that I wasn't going to let them down after everything they'd done for me this was time for me to make good on what had been a pretty disastrous education <laughs> so off I went and and I loved it and for nine years uh, I worked um, in maintenance in Wales and Western, um, I worked my way up to local delivery manager, so off of the tools into managing a team of multidisciplined engineers that looked after uh, radio networks, cable, transmission systems. Um, and they were a really great team of guys that, that I miss, but they taught me um, how to manage people, thankfully, because they were really good at their jobs. <laughs> and um, uh, after that, um, I, I sort of went to join a recruitment agency, something you'll be familiar with. <laughs> there, there was a carrot dangled and I was probably naive at the time um, and thought that I didn't love engineering as much as I did. I was no good at putting bottoms on seats. I didn't like recruitment. I didn't like the stress. And it was frankly an absolute disaster. <laughs> But I think I had an Audi and that made up for it for a little while. <laughs> I remember you telling me part of the attraction of this was a very nice company car. Yeah, I think so, yeah. But anyway, it wasn't to be. Um, I was made redundant. Um, I would have probably done the same. <laughs> I was working in a coffee shop and I made lattes and cappuccinos. And the biggest mistake I was made was serving the wrong cake. You know, it was pretty simple and easy. Yeah. But I didn't have a choice because, well, I had to provide for my family. Um, and for a little while, I, I thought it was okay. But being made redundant really knocked my confidence. It made me think, you know, I'm no good at anything. And my granddad would ring me up and say, you know, this is nonsense. Emma, you've got an IRSC license, you know, Institute of Rail Sigling Engineers. You were the first female engineer on the ground to get one. You... You need to remember who you are and how hard you fought to get here. Mm. You know, you weren't you make lovely cakes, but probably shouldn't be working in that coffee shop, should you? And I had to agree, you know, I had a mortgage to pay. It wasn't particularly lucrative and I was really struggling. So I didn't really have a lot to lose. And I think that's really important that when you have a really great job, jumping ship to start your own business, perhaps, or do something different, you know, you, you've got a conversation to have with yourself. I didn't. Mm. I was serving coffee, yeah. nice coffee, but no, I needed to get back to being, you know, me, um, having a good mental health. You know, at that point, I didn't feel like I was in a good place. I felt like everything was on top and difficult and and the struggle being a single parent is, is hard enough. But a single parent on a low pay job with high outgoings is, is not, not, not a good place to be. Yeah. So my granddad sent me an envelope. Um, at £150 I think it was at the time still got the envelope and a little note that said I believe in you go and register a company and I was like what I don't know anything about business oh god and I actually thought he just loves me a lot and yeah. thinks I can achieve things that I can't and oh but do you know what I'm gonna have to do it because if I don't he'll know <laughs> <laughs> And frankly, I would have spent the money on, on other things that I really needed. But I went, OK. And I sat in my coffee shop drinking one of my lattes. And I had a note, uh, a little napkin. And I wrote names because you can't call it Nuco. It's a bit naff, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I tried to think about names. And I wrote locomotion and trains and moving projects. And I thought, oh, gosh, do you know what? Motion. M motion's nice. And I thought this is a really great name. And I told my mum, and she said, it reminds me of poo. That's what they say. <laughs> what notions have you had when you go to hospital? And I was like, oh, don't ruin this for me. Don't ruin this moment. And again, you know, I, I, I fought against the challenge and said, yeah. no, I like it. Motion is a positive thing. It, it, it's about keeping things moving. It's a play on words with locomotion. I'm not having your poo jokes, mum. <laughs> <laughs> And Motion was born. Training in Motion, Motion Rail, Motion Air, uh, Motion Reality. They're all there now, but they're all Motion. <laughs> so me and my mum still laugh about it frequently. Um, and it, it sounded weird saying it out loud for so very long, which anyone that started a business will know. You feel like a bit of a fraud. Hi, it's Emma from Motion. Yeah. <laughs> you laugh. Yeah. And then eventually it's not silly anymore. Um, but yeah, registered this company. 
I rang around my contacts, um, people that had worked with me and said, have you got any work? Can I do anything? And lo and behold, I started to win little bits of work, you know, cable jointing, installing, and I was charging a day rate for me and built my confidence up. We we then were asked to supply some people and and, and I say we, it was me and my little ones. That's the way, the, the royal way, you know. The team. Um, found other people that would come and work and did a bit of labour supply in Southern Tunnel and got bigger and bigger. And before we knew it, um, it, it was a credible business very, very quickly. Um, and it was growing, but it was very much built around Emma and what Emma was doing and one man band, you know, with a, a bit of help, but I was a one woman band. <laughs> so, um, that was a bit strange, but people wanted to help. They liked this, you know, what you're trying to do something good. They remembered the things I'd done to help them when perhaps they needed support when we were maintaining, you know, if a fault came, go and fix it. You'd built up a rapport with people and, and actually you realize the railway is one big family. We really are. And it doesn't matter where you come and go from people are there that they're there to support and yeah motion grew and then I think there came a point where somebody didn't pay me and it hurt it really hurt nearly took us under yeah and that was a battle and it really again that was that confidence knock that was that moment of I could have lost everything this isn't you know for me this isn't just a job this is my home this is my security my mortgage at the time it was everything and I nearly lost it all because somebody couldn't pay and that year was a bit of soul searching a bit of reflecting and you know what I think I didn't want to be greedy I was incredibly humble I took it back and went back to just being me on a day rate for a bit doing what I did but this time as a tester in charge and working on um, Thameslink and Crossrail projects and it sort of was a step back, and but in hindsight, I really needed that. Um, it helped me remember what what um, what was important, mm. and I decided, you know, we're going to hear a lot about building back better. I think after COVID, but that's what I did after that catastrophic mm. year. I decided I needed structure. I needed to share. I needed a team of competent individuals that would stand by my side because frankly the stress of it all wasn't fun anymore I wasn't enjoying it mm-hmm. and I needed it to become more than just me um, and I think that's a big part for business and for anyone in business that that sort of you get it to a point where you realize the stress now is too much I can't do this by myself and we're not talking shareholders you know or things that we just wanted a team I needed support I needed to have family time I needed to be able to put the phone down at five o'clock and for my children to see mum at dinner, not mum holding a phone going, hang on, sh- one second, sh- sh- I can't, th- oh gosh, I need this contract, you know? That's no fun. And, and most importantly, it's no life. It's it's not enjoyable for my children. And so that's where the change came. And I suppose I did what I do best, which is ring up my friends, people that I'd worked with. You know, I'd made a lot of colleagues along the way now, people I respected, people I liked, people I wanted around me. Um, I had no family here in Wales because my family was all from Devon. And, um, you know, I I created an army. I surrounded myself with my own infrastructure of people, people that all had different skills, different qualities, you know, people that added value in in all sorts of different ways from from being my counsellor, you know, to being my best friend, to turning up with a glass of Prosecco at the end of the day, you know, to hearing me rant when something had gone wrong, to highly technical people like John and Alkis that that bring so much to my, my team now, you know, that they, they bring that credibility, the ability to deliver high-end skill, to the Lawrences that are great with spreadsheets, to the Natalies that are my friend, to Lauren that is most definitely family, you know, these people are my family not just my railway family now and what happens when you build that structure is that the stress relieves and you can think differently and you've got the time to grow um, and develop and I realized that what I love more than anything was watching them succeed they weren't my successes that's why you see the slight embarrassment at the awards but you know what that's their success and they deserve that and all I did was facilitate And I think inspire, because when I talk to them, that's what they say, you know, when I could have beaten them with a stick for putting me, (laughs) I'm very grateful for, I'm not, not, you know, (laughs) 
not, not at all um, saying not thank you. Um, I realised that what I, I do, and it is, it's a gift. It, yeah. it does inspire people. It inspires them to think differently because my story could have been very different. You know, I could have been the council estate mum I was supposed to be. I could have been that failure to the teacher. I didn't finish school. It would have been very easy. And to sit back now and say I run a multi-million pound business <laughs> sounds yeah. silly, um, but I, I really do. You do. Absolutely. Lots of offices. Yeah, lots of chairs, lots of smiling faces. You know, been empty for a while, but they're there. Um, we hold frameworks, national frameworks. We we work for multiple tier one contractors to then have an executive board with people that I respected. And I think this is what really were the pinch me moments when people that I had revered came to work for me. Mm. I sort of thought, wow, this is a bit special, you know, that never thought I'd be in this position to, to, you know, mixing in a social circle as well that was very different, trying to fit in and belong. Um, you know, going to conferences and events thinking, you're not Emma the cable jointer anymore. You're a CEO. Yeah. What even is that? Sorry. <laughs> so don't think I know what that is. Managing director. You're not, not supposed to be called that now. It's CEO, isn't it? I don't know what it is, but I think it's a badge. And actually what I am is, is a leader. Yeah. And that's how I like to think of it. I lead people in delivering their jobs far better than I could ever do them. I let them get on with it. I give them ideas. I give them direction. I talk a lot about ethics and doing the right thing, which is is fundamental to what we have here at Motion. We do the right thing. We try to, you know, and if that's carbon negative, that's setting our science-based targets, that's going into schools, that's giving back. You know, what I realise is actually my successes are really my teams. Like I, I sit and look at them and see what they do and seeing them smile when they finish, you know, their exam and come out of it and go, I passed. And I know we put them through that. That's that is the best part, watching people grow into bigger shoes that they didn't think they could fill and being inspired because they watch me do that. That's the part that I love. That's what I was put on this earth to do, not just to be a mum, as much as I love that job. Yeah. My role in life is to be able to encourage others that believe they, well, hope they could, but don't believe they can. Mm. And, and I think that's the part that, people find inspiring perhaps um that in the face of adversity I chose to challenge it I didn't give in do I think I'm inspirational no I think I'm stubborn <laughs> I think I see the best in people yeah I think I look for things in people and and I notice when they don't necessarily believe in themselves and so I, I nurture them I do the mum thing, I push them out the door, I put their coats on, I make them warm, I give them the tools they need to be the person they want to be. And then I go, go on, get on with it. <laughs> and then watch them flourish. And for me, that's what this is about. For me, this is what International Women's Day is about. It's, it's not just about celebrating the women, it's celebrating the people that help women and men recognize their full potential. It's saying you can be anything that you want to be, but you need to believe in yourself. And, and in my case, my grandparents, my parents and my children believed in me. And that was all it took. And, you know, some people aren't lucky enough to have that support network. You know, as, as catastrophic as my childhood was, I had that. And I think that's the message that I would like to get out today is go and do it. Don't think twice. You know, don't sit and overthink it and doubt yourself. You get one life, go out there and make it whatever you want it to be. And don't look back, never doubt yourself. And don't be afraid because where's that going to get you? <laughs> Absolutely. Do you know, Emma, there's, there's so much in what you've just talked us through. There's just so much there that I, you, that your values, your personal values, the fact that you absolutely, totally and utterly get that business success is derived from people. Mm. So, so it, it's not about 
you know, the size of your office. It's not about the company car. It's not about, you know, how many holes you dig or the fact you have to dig holes for six weeks. It's the people you dub them with, isn't it? It's the camaraderie. It's the it's the, the, the cups of tea. It's the stories you told. It's the, you know, cigarettes you smoked back in the day. It's, yeah. it's all about the people. And for me, that is just you. That is That is where the inspiration comes from. And I think that... This, this thing about believing in other people. I remember the first time you told me the story and it happened again just now when you told me about this envelope that your granddad left for you <laughs> and said, I believe in you. It's like, oh my God, that, and you have paid that forward. Oh my God, how many times? And I know that you will continue to pay that forward because believing in your team is what's making them the team that they are and being the very best version of themselves. You're changing people's lives. It's not, you don't just give them a job. You give them so much more than that. Um, and and yes, do you know what? Yes, you are very, very inspirational as a leader, Emma. You really, truly are. <laughs> I know that embarrasses you, so I'm not going to go on. But I'm going to just kind of, I want to ask you to leave us with a thought that if you were to go back to Emma when she was maybe 12 or 13 and and tell her three things give her three pieces of advice for the future knowing what you know now what would those three things be um I think the first one never give up that's got to be it never give up don't doubt yourself don't give up in believing in you um that's that's really important be careful what you wish for um that's a very double-edged sword <laughs> sometimes i worked really hard for things thinking they were what i wanted when actually they weren't you you have got nothing to prove to anyone at all you know but yourself ultimately and sometimes i, I worked really hard to achieve things that in hindsight weren't for me and didn't make me happy I didn't didn't have anything to prove, only to myself. So I think word, word of the wise, be careful what you wish for. It's not always what's best for you. Um, but don't be afraid, I guess. That's that's the big one. You know, don't be afraid to ask for help. Believe in people. They will come. You know, you only have to say help and mean it and be prepared to give help when it's asked for. Um, the industry, the world is is not a dark place. You know, it's, it's not all doom and gloom. People by nature want to support you and to help you grow um, and believe in that. So never be afraid when it gets too difficult to say, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't feel OK. Help. It will it will come. And it might come with a glass of Prosecco if you're really lucky. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think I think that's it. But um, but yeah, it's an industry I'm very proud of. And and I think that I'd like to say my, my leaving thought is the industry I joined 20 years ago is not the industry we're sat in today. It has the same feelings, it has the same family, but it's evolving, it's changing, it's becoming diverse, it's becoming equal. No boots on ballast on the ground, we're not equal yet, we're a long way off, we're seeing more women, you know, out, out in office positions, um, out on site as well, but front line, we're still lacking, there's more work to be done. But I am immensely proud of what our industry has become. I'm immensely proud that there is feeling. And I think in business, that's the most important thing is that we deal in contracts, um, we, we deal in clauses. Actually, no, we should be dealing in people. And this industry is really good at that. Um, you know, Emma, I could not have put that better myself. I absolutely completely and utterly agree with you this is not about contracts it's not about clauses it's all about people um my absolute huge thanks to you um i have loved this my cheeks are aching from <laughs> but i also know that i can't cope anymore in terms of the emotion about your granddad <laughs> so i feel like i'm gonna go at any minute um emma it's it's just an absolute pleasure and a privilege to hear your story again 
Um, I can't wait until we are in the same physical space and we can celebrate some of your achievements with the old glass of Prosecco. Um, <laughs> so that's definitely a date, hopefully in the summer. Um, but in the meantime, um, my huge thanks to you for joining me on this um, special edition of our Intuitive Insights podcast for International Women's Day 2021. I think you are the absolute epitome of hashtag choose to challenge. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> My huge thanks to Emma. Uh, my cheeks are aching from smiling, um, but I'm also aware that I'm quite feeling quite emotional after that conversation and um, I'm completely and utterly share in Emma's views that believing in yourself and believing in other people is one of the um, privileges of running a small business. So my huge thanks to Emma. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>